it with version control systems so that you can actually go from the users, the roles and the user stories to the tasks, to the actual commits, to the version control system. Uh, and, and you can deal with all of that um, from a project management point of view and see where you are, what needs to be done, what's going on, and stuff like that. Um, the basic, the need for some kind of issue tracking system with Drupal is because if you're a Burning Man, you come back from Birmingham, Burning Man on the Monday, and you sit down and say, what, what, where am I? Ah, I remember it's these two projects, right? So you open them up and say, um, let's see, where was I? You know, so what does this mean? It means that the Drupal projects web application are very complex things. And you need to have a way of working in uh, and wrapping your head around, around something simple, getting that done, then going out and seeing the global picture. So that so what we do is we stand on the on the shoulders of giants who have best practices from uh, the software industry, which has a failure rate of over 70%. Uh, the software industry, according to um, the federal government, the Defense Department, um, has said that uh, the failure rate of software project, projects is over 70%. And, uh, the reason for that is the failure to capture requirements and the failure to trace back the development as it goes on, back to what the client uh, asked for. Uh, in other words, um, the, the culprit here is the famous watershed approach to project development. The, water, the waterfall approach. Uh, waterfall means let's do all the, all the requirements capture, all the analysis, all the design, all the implementation. And so a year later, you show the guy the site and say, what? This is not what I asked for. So the, uh, the, the actual waterfall approach was not so, so silly. But that's what people have been using always. So, you know, the old books used to talk about the analysis phase, the design phase, the data analysis phase, and, and as if you do all of that, and then you get to, well, now we have to talk about an iterative um, approach, an incremental approach, uh, make sure that there's iterations, and we make sure that the client participates actively, and we'll see that in the talk today. So, I don't know what the situation is. Exactly. Excellent. Well, well, as we'll see, you, you, you get all the user stories together which the client has written. You put them on, on the table like three by five cards, you sort them out, and you assign them two iterations uh, based on a nice to have and a risk question. So the architect or the, or the project manager and the client, the client says, well, the, uh, they divide all the user stories into uh, little phases. So you've got a prototype phase, maybe a beta phase, maybe a, a, a final release, and then launch phase. And you, you say, which user stories go? Now, um, so when, when the client comes, and, and then you have frequent builds, and you, there's a test site up that has the latest stable version so that the client can always see what's going on. And you get immediate feedback. So on the one hand, there's not going to be any problem of What's that? You know, uh, and, and apart from that, as we'll see, it's test driven, so that the client actually participates in the writing of the test and the running of the test. Right? Um, um, and um, when the client says, "Ooh, I want um, Salesforce integration," okay, so well, okay, but you see, here we have a list of we don't have like stupid dates, you know, but we have. A list of phases. Now, if you if, let's estimate the Salesforce integration will take uh, I don't know uh, 80 man hours, 40 man hours, okay, S some figure. So well, you know you either spread out the phase, which phase is it going into, and what's coming out because that's going in. So you get a chance to dialogue. Whereas if you just have an approach, well, this is simple. Let's just get the thing up and running. Uh, you just develop, 
you know what I mean? Like uh, Young in a book in the, in the 70s on um, structured programming said, uh, you, you, and you get started on the programming and the rest of you go call the client and find out what he wants. Okay. That approach will lead to not only feature creep, but it'll lead to rejection and failure almost surely because uh, what's, what's, what's given, what's delivered, uh, will have nothing to do with what the client is asking for. I don't know if I can start. Yeah, um, no, 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 because uh, I'll be. Um, Joel? Yes. Uh, can I start? Or? You can. You might want to put this on for audio for you. Know? Oh, okay. We're now beginning. Um, a webfactory.com.ar is my web blog site, and that's where this presentation and any other materials uh, will be posted after the talk, or by tonight, or later. So you might want to jot that down, and then you don't have to worry about copying details or anything, so you know everything's uh, all copied, okay? A little bit about me. Uh, I, I come from um, software development as a programmer in the late 80s um, <coughs> with all kinds of stuff. Migrating towards uh, 10 years ago, luckily, a uh, object oriented uh, paradigm approach. So I have a lot of experience. Uh, that was my first step away from mayhem. My first step away from mayhem was using C instead of assembler. And then, uh, you know, the whole question of object-oriented and, and it's a whole different uh, way approach where the coding is not so important anymore, but rather the analysis and design. And uh, it's interesting. <laughs> then, uh, then I got involved in, as, in working as a system architect. Um, on the one hand, as a system architect, in other words, um, given a project, what kind of architect, three tier, blah, 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 uh, client server, what kind of architect is best going to serve the, the requirements? Um, and on the other hand, I got very interested in process engineering, which is, I got involved, uh, used for many years the Rational Unified Process, which was, an, uh, it's not exactly agile, but it's iterative and incremental uh, approach which um, tries to make sure that risk is mitigated early on and blah, blah, blah. Very interesting question. Um, and CMMI also. Um, and uh, some of the, the biggest, the most memorable things I've been involved in was this telephone building system for the Buenos Aires Telefonica um, using C++ and UML, where I did mentoring in the process, in rational unified process, and uh, did a module uh, of the system myself, so that I enjoyed, that was like a, a year-long project, it was very interesting, uh, informative for me. Um, in the, uh, a point-of-sale system, which was done in enterprise Java with open source tools, uh, using the Spring Framework, and then, uh, I really enjoyed that as a formative experience. Um, uh, in 2006, I went to Venezuela, worked in Venezuela, and uh, um, as, a, a, as a quality assurance and process engineer mentor, we set up a system, and that was very interesting. And I used Drupal as a tool then, as a kind of a wiki, a document wiki for the uh, development site. Um, in 2007, I decided <coughs> to um, become a freelance uh, worker, <coughs> and uh, I, I, in spite of all my experience in object-oriented uh, paradigms and so on and so forth, I uh, chose Drupal as a platform 
because of its great productivity. Uh, and uh, you can just put it up on any shared hosting, you can carry it around with you in any laptop, you don't need uh, the immense infrastructure that you need for Java and other things, and it's not complicated to set up. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, it just impressed me immensely, first as a product that I use, and then as, uh, as a community and everything. I was involved again in the Drupal Dojo group, which was, uh, I think they're gonna start it up again. Uh, it, you know, I needed to find out what's going on with Drupal, what, you know, how do you do stuff with Drupal, and uh, it was a wonderful resource, a very wonderful resource, uh, because it was people just getting up on, on uh, we, we, we projected the screen, and uh, somebody gave a, gave a talk, initially Josh Koenig uh, 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 worked with that, it was a great contribution to the Drupal community. He would get up and start pounding away his keyboard, and uh, screwing up, and nothing would work, and, and, and oh, I've got to go to Drupal, uh, the API Drupal site, and uh, oh, oh yeah, this, uh, it, the syntax is wrong, and that's how we all learn, you know, uh, how to do, uh, how to theme forms, what theming was, you know, the whole works, and uh, the, on, on uh, drupaldosho.net, all of the uh, resources are up there, some of the, the videos, and, and the notes, and, and okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm now trying to bring the question of the Agile approach to software development into Drupal, right? Um, uh, so I'm getting some web applications done uh, and um, finding some difficulties with the staging, uh, finding difficulties with uh, deployment issues. There's gonna be some more talks today which address those issues, so I'm looking forward to them. Um, then, uh, you guys, uh, before I ask this, when there were a few people here, um, how many people here are um, consumers of professional Drupal services? In other words, they, they, they are clients of sites and that need to be done, and they're here to sort of evaluate Drupal to see um, you know, what Drupal is, if, you know, what the process is. Okay, uh, how many people provide Drupal services? Okay, um, and could one or two of you tell me the motivation for, for coming to this talk? Anyone? No rule of one. If I'm going to decide, uh, define the scope of a project, a software project, I need to know what context it's fitting into. So it's not the same if they make French fries uh, or if they provide services. Uh, it's just not the same. And, and what kind of site they need, what their needs are. So where is the site? Where is the website going to fit into their regular business usage? Um, then identify roles. Um, once I know what the business model is. Who are the people who are going to be involved in the application? And who are the stakeholders? The biggest single reason for failure of a software project is failure to identify all the stakeholders. And to, 
to doubt, to not pay attention to some very um, important influential stakeholders who don't say a word until the whole thing's done and then it turns out that you have not gathered the requirements because you didn't talk to all the stakeholders. So the period of identifying the roles of the users and the stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders is anybody who stands to win or lose by the application. Maybe the CEO, it may be some, uh, uh, users of a certain kind you fail to identify. So that's important. Okay, then, then the user stories have to be written. And uh, the, the, the person who has to write the user stories is the client. Because the client knows what the user story is, because we're not concerned with Drupal or Joomla at this point. We're concerned about who, having identified the roles for each role, what are they going to do? In other words, who's going to use the site? What are they going to do? And if you have correctly identified all the roles, and for each role you have correctly identified the kinds of interactions they're going to have with the site, you have captured the requirements. That's the idea. And if you haven't, may, may, may Drupal help you. Um, may the force help you. Okay, so, then once you, the user stories are written, and we'll see a few in a moment, uh, you have to es put little estimation marks on them if you want, in terms of uh, effort points. You know, this is a biggie, put 10, this is 1, this is 5. Just to get an idea. Then um, you plan the release. Planning the release, as we'll see in a moment, means putting all the user stories on the table, like three by five cards, figuratively speaking. And then lumping together the ones that you're going to do in each iteration. Because what you're going to do is you're going to divide the user stories, which describe explicitly all of the functionality and you're going to put them, divide them into little iterations. And in each iteration, it's like you're going to go through the whole process. You're going to redefine, refine the requirements, you're going to do the analysis and design, you're going to do the implementation, and you're going to do the testing. Uh, a little mini project for each user story, actually, and for each iteration. And you are going to build the site. The site's going to be up and running right from the beginning so that the client begins to see what he wants. Okay? What she wants. Then, that's planning, as we'll see in a moment. Then, uh, well, estimate velocity means that you've got to say, what's the team? The, the best thing is to have a team that's worked on several projects already, uh, and uh, you know, the velocity is given something that's uh, 10 points of an effort how long is it really going to take that team? Has the team worked before? Have they done similar stuff? You know, do they get along? Uh, do, are they proficient? Then, uh, you do the iterations, continuous build, feedback, etc. Okay. Now, here we have uh, something more detailed for each iteration. What is the workflow for each iteration? Um, the workflow, for example, I've got 25 users the stories, I've got four iterations. So, okay, let's take the first iteration. And here we have a, effectively, what, what Agile people do is they put, they put the cards on the wall. Okay? And the idea of, of the extreme programming approach is that, um, you know, after a night out, um, going out to the bars with the Drupal folks at the, at the Drupal camp, you know, uh, a few bleary-eyed programmers wander into the office the next day around 10.30 uh, and they take you to the story. Now the advantage of this is that even if you're ble bleary-eyed, you know, and you know the feeling, uh, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to be honest. What you have to do is read the user story and, and implement it and make sure that the test is written by the client and then sit down with the client, say, okay, let's do this. Hey, let's do this together, pair program, you know, it's better because the, the dialogue takes the, the worst thing, and in, one individual is going to get lost, in, uh, two people together work much more efficiently, that's the thesis, and, uh, and you can just get it done and the client's around, or his proxy, 
the pro some somebody from the client has to be uh, involved in this process, like Sky, something, and they have to, have to have written the test and they can run the test. So it means you divide the complexity into manageable bite-sized chunks, and you are able to take uh, one user story and implement it, get it running, you know, and it's up on the test side it's, and it's committed and it's ready to go. Okay, that's that's it. Then, so you discuss the stories, you write the acceptance test, and you uh, this break in, you, you break the story down into a bunch of tasks that have to be done. Uh, in a, yeah. Each each user story has a card, conversation, and confirmation part. In the card, you just say um, a user can do such and such a thing. In the conversation, you're going to say, well, the tasks to actually implement this, which is the first time that the how this is going to be done has been mentioned. Um, the tasks are A, B, C, D, right? And, oh, I think we should use such a module that the other module blah, 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 blah. And it's a bite-sized little chunk. And the, 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 the client should write the acceptance test. And the question you ask the client is, um, in your opinion, what constitutes completion of this user story? If this user story is implemented, uh, what's a good test I could do? Okay, the test is like, sit down, uh, you, you, you sit down in the browser, you invoke the, uh, the, on, the on-site, the site-wide contact form, you fill it out, you hit submit, and then a mail is sent to the proper place, and I can verify that, and um, uh, no one can hack that because there's no mail appears, blah, blah, blah. Whatever the client feels that if this is done, they've got it, okay? And um, then uh, you distribute the responsibility for the task to, to programmers. Um, you estimate the task, you do the task, continuous build, run the acceptance test, and then you raise issues, the bugs. And here somebody asked before about the, the feature creep. You know, but uh, uh, at this point, at this point, the client is going to be seeing what she wants for the first time, which is an awesome moment which often means that the client realizes what they want uh, or someone spoke to them in a week uh, and, and it may be necessary to, to go through the whole thing again right uh, like you, you may have to make some modifications which means as an aside to the to this which is not mentioned in many of the agile the pure agile the pure extreme problem the architecture of the site has to be taken into account early and you must do some of the user stories that affect and have a big impact on the architecture. For example, if you're going to use the services module and you're going to say, okay, I'm going to leave the services to the end. And then you realize that for, a, for some given reason, that's not going to work for you. You don't want to find out at the end and then have to change the architecture. So whatever has a big impact on the architecture should be done as early as possible. That's called uh, risk mitigation, and it's another. Uh, and at the same time, the, the architect should get the architecture clear. What modules are we going to use? No, I, I have. Um, I mentor somebody who loves to download and install modules. You know, and uh, they call me, they call me and they say, "Oh, sorry, it's not working. I don't know what's going on." And okay, oh no, because I downloaded this module, I downloaded the other module, and downloaded the other module, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't have a test site, so I just installed it. You know, now people go in and it doesn't work. Okay, that's, you know, it's common, but you, you, it's, it's, it's my fault, because I, you know, I didn't encourage the person to talk to me and say, before you install modules, that's a process, you know, that's going to affect the architecture. This is not a toy, this is not a static HTML site, this is a web application. And just like any other software project, you can't do that. Okay. So, um, heavy impact things. But, which means that the decision about which user stories go on which iter iteration that we said before. Um, oops. Uh, got it. Uh, um, we said uh, plan the release. And plan the release is where you take all the user stories and you assign them to, to phases. Okay, so there, um, the, the client is going to ask for what I want to have. And the architect is, is going to ask for what I need 
to be done early so I can cast the architecture into stone, okay, to mitigate it. Okay, so it's like a, a nice little battle there. And you have to give the client, you know, the client knows better in a certain sense of what has to be done first. But the architect also has to have the same. Because otherwise, if the hard parts get done at the end, you've got huge heavy impact on the architecture, user story is gonna be done at the end, you're gonna break everything, you have to throw away lots of work. Okay, so we said the first thing you're gonna do is identify the customer. In the bibliography, I have uh, O'Reilly brought this concept of the mean, right, the mean model, right? And that's uh, really cool, the mean model. Uh, this replaces a whole business model in a traditional sense. Um, basically, what you've got, uh, at the top there are three bubbles containing the main public functionality of the website application. Okay. It says, online literary workshop, online magazines, uh, online writer publisher connection. Okay? So this is the basic, these are the means which are, are public and that's what we want to get to and that's the application. It's floating on, on top of a list of principles and, and business principles um, uh, for the literary workshop. Uh, writing is a social process, not an individual process, so they need to have a social interaction. Uh, the writer uh, flourishes in her community. You must produce if you want to be part of the community. A literary work only exists if it's published. The writer needs to be able to acquire three tools. Okay, so these are some of the principles you know, that go into you know, business principles which affect things, which make a difference. Right? And at the bottom is the business activities that have nothing to do with the website, but upon which the re website rests. In other words, what we're really getting at here is the scope of the work we have to do. It's basically the three bubbles on top is the work we have to do. And uh, down below, writers write pieces and show them to others. Writers critique each other's pieces. Writers organize in affinity groups. Writers share ideas. Writers submit their work for publication. Publications call for works to be published. This, these are activities that occur outside of the website in traditional ways. So that's what writers do. So that's the business model here of writers, in a sense. You know, this is just an example. Now, how do you get this done? Uh, you have to interview the client, you have to sit down with the client and, and build this. This is a process of abstraction. And um, um, you should be able to do this. Uh, in the bibliography, there's an online site where you can um, fill in, you can type in stuff and it'll generate the the mean model for you, the mean map uh, for you, okay? Um, moving right along. So the top contains the main public functionality. In the middle, the core is shown as a rectangle housing the positioning strategy and guiding principles. No, this is actually the feasibility of the vision document, shall we say, right? Uh, which may well differ with someone attempting a similar kind of site. Uh, um, what O'Reilly says in his uh, work, is that, uh, which is in the bibliography, is that you may have two workshop, online workshops and they're going to be completely different because the principles are different and the, and the underlying business model is different. So you need to, to compare the three levels to really see if it's similar. For, uh, for example, in, in yesterday's explanation of the Scripps uh, Institute, you said, okay, um, we know we, we need to make sure that new content is is uh, is, is is moderated, but, but anybody can can fix typos. Okay, for example, that's that's a principle, a certain principle of, of involvement that's reflected in the concrete implementation. Uh, yeah, those that stuff at the bottom is not use cases; those are business use cases in a traditional sense. It means that it's what people do outside of the site. For example, if it's going to be a site for the sale of cars, uh, you know, salesmen sell cars, salesmen speak to customers. 
now they can do it through a website, but that's what they do every day. Okay, so what is the business model upon which the application rests? Okay, now once we've identified the customer, we know who the customer is. In this case, it's the riders, uh, they are the customer. Uh, so now we have to go from the customer business model to web app roles. If, if we said if we can identify the roles, and for each role we identify the use cases, we've got the requirements. So, we have a workshop leader, a workshop member, a publisher, and a webmaster. And uh, the, the, the leader is the one who actually runs the workshop, decides who, who to accept in the workshop, monitors if members are complying with requirements, which means they have to write, you know, to stay in, and participates along with other members. So a member is someone who's joined the workshop and actively participates, publisher, publishes a magazine, which means he's gonna browse the content uh, and publish a magazine on the site, and the webmaster does the technical administration. So it's just, you know, in this project, there's four identifiable roles. So what's the question we ask now? What's the next step? For each of these roles, for each of these roles, what are the uses? So, the workshop leader can approve a workshop leader to be classic user. A workshop leader can approve applications to join the workshop from members and magazine and book publishers. A workshop leader can suspend members and publishers, can manage affinity groups, can broadcast messages, can do everything workshop members and publishers can do. Now, these are listed and written by the client. And, um, here we have a mythical client, Pam, who runs the workshop, and she decided that these are the user stories that they should have. You must not go to your client and tell your client what the user stories are. You must go to the client and find out what the user stories are. Because if you don't find out, you're gonna find out after you finish everything. And you have to redo everything later, okay? This is, sounds very simple, but we all have made that mistake, all of us. So I can't tell you how important it is to make sure that you elicit from the client the, the user stories, okay? So I've listed the user stories here for two of the, uh, of the roles. And, uh, and then you take it and you sort of help make sure it gets abstracted, okay? So now we do a user technique called lexical analysis, which basically I could, you know, in an extreme case, I could say, I'm gonna take the verbs and I'm gonna take the nouns. The nouns are entities, are business objects. And the verbs are gonna be um, operations that those entities can carry out. So I could do a UML analysis based on this lexical analysis. Is that clear? Um, right, a, a, a unified modeling language, in other words, <clears throat> There exists a way of doing analysis and design, which is called the Unified Modeling Language, um, which allows you to define the domain model at the analysis stage. Uh, so you can identify all of, uh, in other words, it's the first step. Here you have, on this line, you have the requirement. What is the behavior of the application? What is going to happen? What functionality? Okay. And over here is how we can implement this. Given a piece of functionality, what's under the hood? So the domain model is the first step in penetrating the functionality expressed by the client in business semantics, meaning in language which reflects the business components. And you're going to take that and say, how we can actually do it? You'll see what I mean in a second. In other words, Workshop leader can approve applications to join a workshop from members and magazine and book publishers uh, can manage affinity groups, organic groups, okay, cool. So you see the procession, okay, the problem. Can broadcast messages, okay. Uh, workshop member can, can post literary pieces, okay. Um, can make any post public, blah, 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 blah. So you are capturing here for yourself 
and you are penetrating the features and you're going to the domain, which is that group of objects uh, which, uh, whose behavior is going to implement the, fu the functionality you're trying to get together. Is that basically clear for this? Okay. Then, so then we actually can, can do a domain model. We've got the, the workshop leader, the workshop member, and the publisher, and their relationship to entities. So we've got blog, forum, affinity group, application. Application it means application to join, application for membership. And then workshop, then you've got uh, literary piece, maybe versions of it, uh, critique. And then you, you say, well, how about if you use the comments how about if literary piece is a content type and we use and we allow comments and the comments are the critiques? That may be sufficient. You have to do it and then see if the, if the client says, well, I, you know, the comments are not so good. Let's, is there some other way we can do the critiques? And maybe you have to have another content type that's critique. But but you, we're moving from the her requirements to what we're doing. We're not deciding for her you know, what we're going to do. And we're doing it iteratively, one step at a time. So, then, um, there are some modules that were mentioned, that the case module, the project module, and others, the, the site uh, documentation module, and stuff like that. I think the best thing is just to put something together based on, on Drupal, missing here, um, basically, 
what has to be done is that the user stories uh, have to be written. Okay, so this is a view which lists um, content type of, of type user story um, and uh, you can look at all of the user stories that have been assigned to the prototype. Um, Uh, yes, uh, I'm writing a, a book, uh, Leveraging Drupal, and as I'm writing the book, I'm making this online literary workshop from chapter one to the end. It's going to end up as a um, installation profile for Drupal. Oh my God, we're almost over here. The time really went by quick. Um, we have, I think we have 15 minutes. Um, there's tons of stuff I want to show you. Um, so, this one here, um, is the user story, and if we edit it, we might see it more clearly. Uh, so we say, name, a workshop leader can approve applications to join the workshop. Right now the status of this is test pass, but we would say uh, in progress, you know, if the user story has never been implemented. Then we can do a view, we can, we can list all the user stories that have not been implemented or all the user stories that have failed, okay? Then, um, this is how you assign a user story to a given uh, role. So all, all this is, is um, a, a, a content type, which uh, I will publish to, with the notes, the exported uh, content types of the acceptance test, the user story, etc. And uh, who is the actor? It's interesting because then I can sort of see all the user stories where such and such a role is the actor and so on and so forth. The card is what the client writes. Okay, it says the workshop leader uh, can list all the outstanding membership application and can either approve, reject, or postpone action on them. Okay, and um, here I have the user story details. Otherwise, it's so long. And um, so you got, uh, in the conversation part, is when you take the user story and you can actually start doing it. And so you say, oh, um, and, and so you, you speak to the client about how you're going to implement it. Victor notes that the applications correspond to the application content type, which is created. And then it might be an application for membership as publisher or workshop member. Okay, Pam explains that membership applications may be new, approved, rejected, or postponed. Um, Pam says it would be nice if applications could be approved, rejected, or postponed with a single click, blah, blah, blah. Victor says this should be a subordinate user story that it should be postponed to a later rather than an earlier iteration. And that's the answer to the feature creep. Because here's, you've got a place to actually dialogue about that stuff. If you don't dialogue about that, you're dead, you know. Because okay, what do we do when when the, when the client comes and says, "Can we have like uh, users created automatically on the fly?" Sure, you know. Okay, but that takes a day to to develop. You know, where is the planning for that? Okay, so what gives? You know, either we we postpone the functionality or, or we move the, the dates. Something has to give. You know? uh, and the customer decides with you. It's not that you're saying, "Oh, I'm late. I'm late. I'm late." Well, weirdly, because we decided to include more functionality. Okay, great. Then, then the next part, which makes a qualitative difference here, is that we have the confirmation section. And this is the confirmation section is where it becomes a test-driven approach. Uh, why? Because uh, the user writes the test, the test here. Um, we, we actually have another content type, which is the acceptance test, which is a bit more formal. You know, it says um, a pre-requirement, you know, what's the state of the universe before you start? What do I actually do? Uh, what's the observation point so I can find out, I can verify if the test is passed? All of that also has to be written by the client. But uh, sometimes it's ridiculous to spend more time on the process than you're doing on the development. Some projects just don't require that, you can just use the card section. So the, here the, the, the client has put their criteria about, I will say this work has been done if 
these confirmation points are met with, which is a big deal. You know, it's done. Because otherwise, this is deep feeling in all approaches, you never know what, you never know if it's done, if it's not done, you know, so, you know is it done yet? Uh, Picasso has to be uh, dragged, kicking and screaming from his work of art, okay? Uh, just do what, don't invent requirements for the client, like everybody does, to show that you're really great development, you know. Do what you said you can do, don't, don't invent it. Because otherwise you screw up, it's gonna take time, you know. These are all, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, uh, today I'm not presenting you, but there are several, uh, the simple test, uh, um, which is a, uh, a unit test of the, uh, of the, here we're talking about black box testing. Um, Selenium is, is one tool which you can use for uh, making a macro, which can execute the passes here. Um, and simple test also has a module, doesn't it, that uh, allows you to make uh, black box testing. By bla uh, black box testing means um, we're not doing the unit test. When you write a module, you write some PHP, you need to do a unit test of that as part of the development. Development time includes testing, it's not testing, another process. The unit test is part of development. So when you implement, you do the test. So that's a unit test, and for that we have simple tests and simple test modules for modules, you know, and stuff. But what you need is some kind of macro where you're going to put the thing through its paces, and uh, and you're going to use that as a regression test later on because when you add other functionality, you want to make sure you didn't break that. And when you um, when you uh, put the site, change the, the location of the site, you deploy the site, and then uh, you want to make sure it's, it's still the same. You run the, re the regression test to make sure nothing changed. Like that. So yes, it can automate. It can be taken to a level of automation. It's not uh, taken to a level of automation here. Um, so the, the users identify the rules. At any point in time, we can look. This is implemented with organic groups. You know, organic groups. We have the dev group. Okay, so a member of the dev group, which is not, does not appear in the general directory, is on your site when you're developing for the client, it's on the same group of site. It doesn't take up much. And only you and the client will see it, and you can create a special, uh, you can create an acceptance test, and you can create a project document, a user story, and stuff like that. And then with views, um, in this project section, probably by the time this, this gets finished, you'll be able to, to have other views, many different views uh, of all the stuff, okay? So basically, um, the, the acceptance test looks like this. Um, again, the edit shows more. The acceptance test is more formal. Maybe you want to use that for, the, for final delivery. Um, you say what the user story is, which is a, an order completion of the user story, the title, um, the date you ran it, the purpose, initial conditions and requests, uh, uh, prerequisites, observation point, which means, you know, do I have to look at the database, do I have to look at, at, at the browser, do I have to look at, and the test steps, right? So, um, and another thing is that when you implement that user story about applications, you know, uh, that includes sticking it on the menu. So. So you're actually prototyping the thing as you're going along, okay? That's the, the basic idea there. Um, let me just make sure. Um, so this is such a short period of time for, for a topic like this. Um, organic groups, CCK views, you can put together your own uh, mix of, of this kind of thing pretty easily. Um, then, as a, a kind of a summary, you know, to, to prototype, you're taking the first user story, you complete the card conversation confirmation with the client, okay? Um, maybe the client is too verbose and writes too many user stories, okay, so you make a dialogue, make sure, keep it down to 20, 25, and, um, uh, 
then you help the process of abstraction. But, but it's, it's her emergent, what she is saying. Okay. Can't hear you. No, no, uh, uh, no. 2025 should be enough for most sites. Um, uh, but if you need more, no problem. You know, but if you've got like 100 user stories, you're doing something wrong. Uh, because it's just, you're, you're, it's just explosion of stuff and you're, you're, you're implementing.